joining on the internet. We are so blessed that you have joined us today, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will work in your lives as you hear this message. And as we prepare ourselves to hear God's word and to hear the message, let's center ourselves in God by breathing in the breath of life that God breathes into us. Breathe in the name of the Father. Breathe in the name of the Son. And breathe in the name of the Holy Spirit. I hope you feel better. I do. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I mentioned one of my recurring nightmares. It's the nightmare where I sometimes find myself back in high school or college facing the final exam for a course that I didn't even know I'd registered for. Now, I'm not, I was never that much of a slacker, but for some reason, that's my nightmare. And a number of you came up afterwards and said that you had nightmares like this, too. Well, a few nights ago, I had one even better. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot something. Hold on a second. Just give me, just give me a second here. Okay. Well, actually, uh, th this actually is part of the nightmare. I, I dreamt that I was about to preach in a church that I'd never been in before. I think I was substituting for the regular pastor. I'd, I'd done that a few times in seminary. And I realized, as soon as I got to the, the pulpit, that I didn't have my manuscript. Mm-hmm. Some of you might actually remember the morning that this actually happened here at Trinity. I got up here and I found a stack of paper that had absolutely nothing to do with the sermon, so I ran back into my office while everybody was waiting here, grabbed the manuscript, came back up here, and then fumbled through whatever it was I was going to say that day. Because you never know what's going to happen at Trinity, honestly. Well, anyway, so in my nightmare, I'm running all over the sanctuary looking for my manuscript, and I can't find it anywhere. I think somebody moved it. Uh-huh. Yes. Looking right at Evie. No, Evie sometimes puts my script back in order, you know? So, but I can't find it anyway. I think somebody's moved it, and I can't find it anywhere. So I figure, okay, I'm just going to preach from the Bible. I'm just going to pick a phrase out of somewhere. Deuteronomy, Leviticus, whatever. Okay, I'll just pick us something. So I run all around the sanctuary looking for a Bible, but I can't find one. I find books on Christian history, Methodist history. I find old issues of the upper room, but I can't find a Bible anywhere. So I think, okay, I'll just preach something off the top of my head. Okay, whatever's in here, I'll just preach it. The only problem is there's nothing in here. It's all on paper. When I, seriously, if somebody asks me at 12.30, what did I preach on? I'm like, I don't know. I forgot. It's already gone. And I can, I can see myself fumbling around, and then people start to get up and they leave. And then I hear myself saying, come back, come back. And then I woke up. I hate it when I have dreams like this. It just sets such a terrible tone for the morning. But that morning, I knew exactly what I needed to do. I didn't hesitate. I reacted immediately. You see, because in the 21st century, in the United States, when stress builds up inside us, whenever we have bad dreams, whenever problems or, or conflicts or internal, internal stuff arises, whenever there's a doubt, what do we do? We throw money at the problem. I went to Amazon. I logged into my account first thing that morning, and I bought myself a brand new goatskin leather single-column reference Bible. 
Oh, yeah. Retail therapy cures all. I won't tell you how much it cost, but <laughs> they're not free here. But I will tell you what I tell my wife, Kim, every time I buy a new briefcase or a backpack. This is the last one I'll ever need. This is awesome, and I'll never need a new one. Uh-huh, right, sure. After that nightmare, this is my preaching Amex card. I will never leave home without it. <laughs> and you know what? I might actually need a new briefcase to go with the brand new Bible. So, more retail therapy. You, oh, my wife? Yeah, probably. Yeah. She'll hear about it. And then I'll hear about it. But it's all good. Now, of course, we could psychoanalyze this nightmare and chalk it up to preparation anxiety flavored with the tests I'd failed in school. But after reading the book of Joel, which we will hear in a minute, I realized that there might be a deeper fear at play here. At some point in our lives, we will all face a moment of truth. There will come a time in our lives when we will have to give an accounting. Not just to ourselves. And not just to a crowd of people. But to God. And when that time comes, what answer will we give? Can we honestly say that we have been faithful and righteous every single moment of our lives? Can we honestly say that all our lives we did what we could to make disciples of Jesus Christ and transform the world? Can we honestly say that every moment of our lives we embodied God's love for others? If we're honest with ourselves, I think we can answer a little yes and a little no. Or a little yes and a lot of no. Probably not sufficient to call ourselves completely righteous in God's book of life. And given the imagery offered by the prophet Joel of the great and terrible day of the Lord, which we will hear in a minute, that answer should rightly scare us. But so long as we have breath, even in Joel, so long as we have breath, we can turn back to God. Yet even now, let's turn away from whatever it is that separates us from God and neighbor and turn back to the way of God. Over the last few weeks, we've meditated on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We remembered how before God speaks light into existence, the Spirit of the Lord hovers over the dark and unformed waters. We recall from the story of Noah how even as the ark and the animals float aimlessly on the ocean for days on end, the Holy Spirit is hard at work clearing the waters away for dry land to appear. From the book of Exodus, we marveled at how God sets the pillars of cloud and fire before the Hebrews, guiding their way through the wilderness. And last week, the prophet Ezekiel offered us an ever-present and everlasting vision of the people of God restored to life, offering yet another chance to live, not only in our own selfish and self-interested way, but in the self-giving way of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this time, we turn to Joel, who paints a terrifying picture of the Day of Judgment. If you read the first two chapters, and Joel is, I think, only three chapters long, so you could read it for lunch today if you'd like, you'll see that according to Joel, the great and terrible day of the Lord is like a swarm of locusts devouring every crop in their path. 
The day of the Lord is like an unstoppable army of invaders capable of scaling city walls and bringing ruin to all who dare oppose them. The day of judgment is like an all-consuming fire which traverses the land and leaves a trail of devastation behind. And after the swarms and invasions and destruction, the people of Judah face a bleak future. Joel offers a, a truly terrifying vision, and yet this is the vision that the Apostle Peter opens with when he preaches to the people on the day of Pentecost. And by the end, 3,000 people repent and come to believe in Jesus. So Joel is worth a closer look. Let's now hear Joel chapter 2, verses to 12 through 17. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the aged. Gather the children, even infants, at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a, a, byword, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is your God? Yet even now, says the Lord. Return to me with all your heart. So long as we have ruach, the breath of life, the animating spirit, so long as we live, we can turn back to God. And God will welcome us. Even in the face of invading armies and swarms of locusts and devastating fire, Joel paints a picture of a God filled with steadfast love who will, even at the very last moment, intercede and save God's people from the ravages of sin. But it takes a turning. And as I've mentioned before, it's not only an individual turning. After all, locusts don't just swarm one farm. Armies don't just invade one village. Fire doesn't just consume one community. God's day of judgment comes upon everyone. As we recite in the Apostles' Creed, Christ will come back to judge the living and the dead. In his sermon entitled, The Great Assize, our founder, John Wesley, paints a picture of the Day of Judgment equally terrifying to the vision Joel offers. But Wesley goes into even finer detail about God's examination of humanity. And in that day shall be discovered every inward working of every human soul, every appetite, passion, inclination, affection, with the various combinations of them, of every temper and disposition that constitute the whole complex character of each individual. 
So it shall be clearly and infallibly seen who was righteous and who unrighteous, and in what degree every action or person <coughs> or character was good or evil. Can you imagine? Our every thought, our every passion, our every appetite, our every desire, not to mention every behavior, every mistake, every hurtful word or deed, moment after moment of sin, great and small, all laid bare before God. And what might God say about those who lived their lives holding the power to change life for many? to bring justice and equanimity to the world, but did not. God knows the depth and breadth and authenticity of our faith, no matter what we profess with our lips. Now, Wesley held the ideal of the true Christian to such a high standard, that such an exemplar of faith and, and moral rectitude, that even towards the end of his life, he questioned whether or not he was authentically Christian. Wesley was a master of self-examination. But lest we think that all this fire and brimstone stuff pertains solely to those benighted folks outside our pious little circle, Let's think again. Joel aims his criticism squarely at the people of Judah. Peter aims his sermon at the Jewish people from all over the Middle East, the diaspora, all of the Jews who have come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And in the great assize, John Wesley preaches to a civil court prior to the openings of legal proceedings in 1758. And while Wesley eruditely and effusively praises the people of the court, he also lays upon them a heavy responsibility. You, whose office it is to execute what is given you in charge by him before you stand, how nearly are you concerned to resemble those that stand before the face of the Son of Man? Those servants of his that do his pleasure and hearken to the voice of his words. Does it not highly import you to be as uncorrupt as them? To approve yourselves the servants of God. To do justly and love mercy to do all as we would they should do to you. So shall that great judge under whose eye you continually stand say to you also, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Wesley really knew how to dole out the praise and prod the conscience at the same time. And to Wesley, and Peter, and Joel, wealth, social position, and political power don't matter. All will stand before God and give an account. All as individuals and as a people. Okay, Pastor. Why the guilt trip? Why the fire and brimstone? Why the day of judgment? I mean, it was only a nightmare, wasn't it? And it's the middle of summer. I mean, seriously, did not the retail therapy help you at all? 
And of course, we're all church-going people, aren't we? Saved by our proclamation of faith in Jesus. I mean, why do we have to worry about this sort of thing? Well, yeah. But at the same time, I wonder if we cannot all take a good look at our own lives and find some area, some manner of living that still misses the mark and creates a distance between ourselves and God or a distance between ourselves and our neighbor. And let's remember our heritage. As Methodists, we are all moving onward to perfection. We're saved in Jesus, but we are also moving forward and continually sanctifying ourselves. So let's ask ourselves, is there something hurtful that we have said or done? Is there something that we have left unsaid or undone? Do we need to ask for forgiveness? Do we need to forgive? Is there a relationship that needs mending? Or do we need to change the way we relate with others, how we treat others? Could we all use a little more time to pray each day? I think if we took a good look at our lives, we might find where we still are in need of God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness in Jesus Christ our Lord. But see, that's the good news. We can turn to God in Jesus Christ so long as we have breath, so long as we have life, God's invitation to turn back to God and walk in the way of God is always open to us. We are invited and welcome. We can live lives that honor God and reveal God's everlasting love to our neighbors. Yet even now, we can call out to the Holy Spirit to work in us and around us and be a blessing to the world. Someday we will all face that moment of truth. A question, a crisis, a decision. Whatever it is, I pray that the truth that is revealed about each and every one of us, that the truth revealed about us as a people, is that we are a faithful, God-loving people committed to living the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for breathing the breath of life into us. And thank you for gathering us together here as your people. God, we confess to you that we have not always loved you above absolutely everything. We confess that we have not always loved our neighbor. And we confess that there are things in our life that we have said and done, and things in our life that we have left unsaid and undone that do not align with your vision of life for us. And so, God, we pray that you will change our hearts, that your Holy Spirit will work within us, that we may become a more loving people, that we may love and receive our neighbors as you love and receive us, and that you will energize us and embolden us to spread your love most of all among all the people of this world. God, we thank you for every blessing in life. Especially we thank you for your son, Jesus, 
who opened his entire life to us and gave of himself completely, gave his life that we might be forgiven of our sin and stand before you, wiped clean of all sin. And God, for this ultimate amazing blessing, we now offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.